Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Great to see people. Okay, I'll do a quick introduction as I am new to or the new face of the WIS network. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Roberts. I'm one of the regional coordinators for Technicamps and I lead on uh, a lot of the girls in STEM uh, projects with us with the project. Um, so I've taken over from Julie um, hosting um, these WIST uh, seminars. Um, so I'm going to give um, a brief overview of Technicamps and what the project does before we hand over to our speaker today, who is Jenny Clark, who's with us as well. <clears throat> so I shall share my screen. Let's cross this one all work. Okay, is that okay, everyone? Can you give me a thumbs up if that's looking okay? Fab. Thank you very much. Okay, so Technicamp's uh, WIS network is a network for women in the technology sector or those um, interested in the technology and digital sectors um, in business and industry. Um, and we just try and get um, women in those areas together and present them with things that may be interesting, um, inspiring or very useful for you um, to um, just progress in, in your area of work. So Technicamps as a whole, the project has lots and lots of different arms. So we have our WIST network for our women in STEM and our GIST network for our girls in STEM. Um, and science technology and then we also have our main Technicamps workshops which is schools outreach workshops and I'll go into a little bit more detail. We have primary school and secondary school outreach, we have teacher training, um, techno clubs, sort of after school clubs and live sessions online as well as the Institute of Coding um, in Wales which is based um, partly at Swansea, partly at Cardiff University. <clears throat> So our main aim is enriching the STEM curriculum for secondary pupils particularly um, and primary pupils um, and also um, inspiring young people to, to go on um, and continue to study STEM subjects as they go through their education. So our Girls in STEM project is um, an extremely sort of uh, extremely close to my heart, uh, being a, a prior physics graduate. Um, and we do lots of events with girls only or with lots of female role models um, presenting sort of how they have got into their, um, their careers and what their educational background is to inspire the young girls to do the same. Um, playground computing is our primary school arm where we uh, go into primary schools and deliver lots of um, exciting workshops to introduce uh, those pupils into technology and STEM subjects and computer science. Uh, but we also go in um, to schools and uh, do a lot of teacher training. So primary and secondary teachers to make sure um, that they are confident in delivering our computer science curriculum and our digital skills. Coding clubs where pupils can come after school uh, they come to the university campuses that we're based at or we do them online as well due to uh, a certain situation at the moment. Um, so that is mixed groups, girls, boys, homeschool pupils, pupils in school um, who can attend the coding clubs. Um, and we also support um, students at the universities that we're based at to be ambassadors. Um, they get to go out and support our workshops um, and develop really good communication skills um, and skills that can help them in their future careers as well. So we run a degree apprenticeship based at Swansea University which is fully funded um, so that is in I think software development so I'll give me a nod if I'm 100% <laughs> correct on that because that's not my area of expertise um, but there is Casey and uh, one of our other delivery members that I run the course. And then we've got our WIST network, so that's what we're here for today. Um, so, without further ado, you don't want to hear me talking about stuff like this. So, we're going to pass on to pass over to Jenny. I'm going to do a quick introduction. So, I know Jenny through a sports team we used to be on. Uh, we used to roller skate around in um, an oval shape and hit each other quite hard when on roller skates. So, if anyone knows roller derby, then she's pretty good at that. 
<laughs> when, we, when we've had practice. Um, but Jenny has worked um, as a lead in marketing teams in HE, um, energy consultancy and the charity sectors. She is now the digital director of Bright Sprout, which is a company that supports SMEs to achieve growth and potential. And as digital marketing director, so she provides um, training on all things brand related, um, but especially developing personal brands for individuals and for companies. So that's what we're going to be talking about today: is developing your digital brand and sort of, I'm assuming, online presence. But I'm going to learn as much as everybody, I think, from Jenny today. So. Very excited about that. So I will pass over to Jenny. After we've had her presentation, we will be splitting into some small, smaller breakout rooms to have a chat about what we've learned, what's relevant to us, and maybe come up with a question or two to ask Jenny when we when we come back into the group. So I'm going to hand over to Jenny. She's going to share some slides from, from her end. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me along today. Um, as Laura said, I am going to be discussing brand you, so your personal brand, why that's important, how you can develop that, and yeah, why you might want to. Hopefully with lots of actual useful hints and tips along the way. So a bit about me. Um, so, well, my, my personal brand, I guess. So yes, I am a marketer, um, got over 10 years experience across multiple sectors. Um, and I specialize in digital marketing. So that's all the ways that we promote ourselves and um, our organizations and businesses online. I'm a business owner, so um, digital, di yeah, digital director and part owner of Bright Sprout, um, which is a creative and digital marketing agency. And as Laura said, we specialize in helping small to medium sized companies um, reach their goals and grow. Um, and then I'm also a mum. So um, I have a cheeky little toddler called Edith. She's going to be two in February. Um, and so I'm coming at all of this very much through a time-starved working mum lens. So I'm very sympathetic to anyone who feels that they don't have a lot of time for personal branding. Um, but hopefully I can, I can help you out a bit there. So what is personal branding? A good place to start. Um, very simply put, it is how you come across to others, both online and offline, but we really mean in a professional capacity. Um, so for the, for the purposes of this talk, certainly, I'm going to be thinking about your personal branding in relation to um, your career ambitions. So one level on, it's how you present your skills, your experience, your values and your personality um, in order to promote yourself it's a way to get known for a certain area so a really good starting point is to think what would you like to be known for um, it's an opportunity to highlight your strengths and one of the most important aspects of all of this is that it's an ongoing process so personal branding is not something that you can just look at and go oh good I've done my personal brand that's me finished I can move on it's something that constantly needs to be looked at because you are constantly changing and growing and so your personal brand needs to be constantly changing and growing um when I told my other half I was doing this presentation I was asked do I need a personal brand and the answer to that is you already have one. So this is much less a question of whether you want to um, have a personal brand. It's much more about how you manage your personal brand. Um, a few years ago, well, going quite, quite a few years ago now, um, your personal brand probably was restricted to how you came across in the office um, or those you might meet at, at conferences or events. But we are pretty much all online now. That has huge, huge benefits. We can reach far bigger audiences. We, we can connect so much more easily with like-minded people. Um, but it means that we're, we're really out there in a way that just wasn't the case, um, you know, a, a couple of decades ago. And that is why personal branding is such a hot topic. I think it's this realisation that if we, all, if we are all online, we need to be looking at how we sort of massage our brands into what we want them to be rather than just letting them grow organically because they can be so so valuable 
Um, which brings us nicely onto the benefits. So huge, huge benefits of being well-known and respected in your field. So in other words, having a strong personal brand. Um, it can open up so, so many doors. I've listed a few here that are just off the top of my head, but there's, you know, the list is endless really. Um, but yeah, networking opportunities, it, it's absolutely crucial that you're putting yourself out there to find others who are also working on similar things, who might be interested in um, sharing ideas, meeting up, um, having that support network, really important. Um, you might be asked to do speaking engagements, you might get media coverage or publicity for your work. Um, partnerships and collaborations is a big one. So with Bright Sprout, by putting um, our personal brands out, um, we generally sort of focus on LinkedIn. Um, we've met so many people who we can collaborate with. So most of our preferred suppliers have come through us finding people through their personal brand or them finding us through our personal brands. It's often not the businesses themselves, it's the people that you connect with. Um, personal branding is huge when it comes to getting jobs. So most, if not all, employers now are going to research you online before inviting you to interview or offering you a job so just controlling the narrative of what's out there is is hugely important in in getting your dream job funding um so if you're in academia and you, you're going after research grants obviously it helps if you're well known in a particular field you know um research councils can be much more inclined to give their money to to people who they've heard of um and the same goes for business investments. If you've got a business, you're looking to attract investors, they need to have heard of you, they need to know who you are, they need to trust you. And then personal branding can directly lead to sales. Um, just look at um, all the influencers, all the influencers that are out there at the moment. Um, but you know, in all sorts of different sectors, um, the way that, that, that people connect with you can be a direct cause of sales. Or if you're in the charity sector, fundraising as well. And as I said, this list is endless, but there's a huge, huge benefits to putting yourself out there and um, making sure that you're coming across, coming across in the best way online and offline. The really great news is that building your brand is easier than you might think. Um, and the reason is that it's so, so crucial to be yourself authenticity is everything when it comes to branding whether that's your personal brand or a business brand people can sniff out inauthenticity a mile off and they just run so being yourself is is just crucial and so that's the easiest thing to do right you know you, you're, you're putting across your thoughts your values your skills your experience um this also means that you do not need to be afraid of injecting a bit of personality into proceedings. So whether you're um, a serious person or you're a really outgoing person, it doesn't matter. You're, the point is that you're being you. And the reason that's so important is because people connect with people. So you don't need to fit yourself into this mold of what you think an expert in your field should look like or somebody who's, you know, uh, doing good things in your field should look like that you know there is no mold just be yourself having said that it's really important to have a focus so obviously there's a million things that make up you as an individual and you might be working across multiple things within your particular area of expertise so having a focus can really help you um narrow down what you're going to talk about which makes it easier to think of things to talk about um, when you know whether that's online or when you meet people offline so it's three questions that are really really useful to ask yourself is what do you want to become known for what are you passionate about and what are you good at and through those three questions you can narrow down the 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 focus of what you're going to present to the world and it just means that you're going to be um, known for those areas much more quickly the last point is be consistent which ties very much into the first point of be yourself your online and your offline personas should not be dramatically different from each other so if someone meets you in real life they shouldn't be surprised at how different you come across um, from from how you present yourself online 
it, it all comes back to this authenticity thing. So be consistent wherever possible. And then whenever I'm working with clients on this, they always say, I, but I've got nothing to say. Where do, where do I start? But nothing, I've got nothing of value to say. And you do. Um, it's imposter syndrome talking if you think that you don't, because how many years have you been training or working in your particular area? It's, it's probably over a decade um, at least. So don't underestimate the value of your knowledge and achievements. Um, you absolutely do not need to be the world expert in what you do to say something of worth. Um, a really good exercise to do is think about the amount that you've learned over the last five years and how, how amazing that would have been if you could, if somebody, you know, five years ago, if you could have told yourself all the things that you've learned or, and, and give yourself all the skills that you've developed in the last five years, that would help you out so much. And that's what you can provide for other people. So there's always going to be um, people who are earlier on in their career path than you you will have knowledge and experience that can help them out. So you don't always have to be um, talking about the cutting edge of your field. You could just be talking about what you're working on, how you got there, how other people interested might also get to that point. Yeah, there, there are always things to say. Plus, you don't always have to be producing original content um, when you're talking online. Obviously, if you're, you know, an academic giving a conference paper or, um, you know, submitting research uh, for publication, then yes, that does need to be original content. But for everyone else and for um, anyone who's promoting themselves online, it doesn't need to be original all the time. The content curation says as much about you as content production. So if you see something interesting in your um, field or just something that, you know, catches your eye, share it comment on on that and that is building your brand because you are telling people something about you by telling them what you're interested in and adding your thoughts to a conversation that is happening within your field um, and the mantra to always stick by is post content that reflects your work interests and values if you do that you, you really can't go too far wrong um, when you're looking at where you should build your brand, um, it is really important just to take a step back and try and be a bit strategic with it. Um, so what are you looking to achieve? Where are your target audience? You know, what platforms are they on? What are your skills and what do you enjoy that's going to help you build a personal brand? So, for example, if you're really good at writing, then it makes sense that you would maybe write articles, write a blog. Um, or write longer form posts on social media. If you're really into public speaking, then maybe um, giving talks, like I guess like I'm doing now, or um, uh, you know talking at conferences, that might be something to focus on. If you've got web design skills, why not build yourself a website? You know, it's all it's always going to depend on where your strengths lie as to where you should focus your attention. But the the top two questions are the most important. What are you looking to achieve? And how are you going to reach your target audience? So when we look online, social media is an absolute must. It's such a powerful brand building tool. Um, you're probably already on social media for a personal capacity. If you're not using it for um, you know, in a professional capacity, then that's, the, that's a good place to start. And if you're unsure how to make that transition, LinkedIn and Twitter are generally considered the most professional social media networks. So that'd be a good place to start. But obviously it depends on, on what you do and, and what you're working on. So if, you, if there's a highly visual element to your work, Instagram might be a good choice. Um, and if you're producing videos on a regular basis, then YouTube or maybe TikTok um, would be something to look at as well. What I will say about social media is that there is absolutely no need to jump on every single new social media bandwagon. Um, it's a it's a really you know fast developing area. There's always something new going on. Um, as a marketer, I do try and keep a little toe in each of the different channels so I can monitor them, see what's happening, and see what I need to recommend to clients. You know what might work for different. Um, people and organizations 
but for personal branding that's a terrible idea um to build a personal brand pick a platform one or two platforms and do them well don't try and spread yourself too thin um a personal website or blog is brilliant if you have the time and the motivation to actually you know build and maintain that and keep it going the reason that it is a good option if you can have one though is because you can go into more detail um, and it, it's an opportunity to really give a, a much um, a bigger flavor of what it is that you're all about what, what you're working on um, and you'll see that any sort of um, sort of famous uh, person in any field is probably going to have a website of their own so at some point it, it might become a must for you but um, it's just something to consider if you don't have the time to um, build and maintain a website which is a lot of work then um, guest blogging or writing articles for other websites is a really good option so um, look for people who are already um, you know they, they've already got sites that cater to your particular um, area of expertise get in touch with them offer to write something that's you know well informed and they all love you for that because it's saving them a job and then podcasts are the other area which works in a very similar way so you can either start your own podcast which again is a lot of work or find those that are already in existence for your area and ask to be interviewed um, and people are always far more open to to this than than you might imagine you know again I think it's that British sensibility of oh well you, who would want to interview me but you'd be surprised so do get in touch with people um, and then yeah let's not forget offline so speaking at conferences um getting published in either academic journals or in the press or you know, relevant industry magazines and then attending industry events are still really important and again if this is where your strengths lie then utilize this and the humble business card is still a thing so don't forget that you know there are these offline ways to build your personal brand as well um, with all of this there is absolutely no need to be starting from scratch or to reinvent the wheel so learn from others because there will be those in your field who already have a really fantastic online presence um, and they're easy to find because they've got a good online presence. So um, look for those people and learn from them. See what they're doing. What platforms are they speaking on? How frequently are they posting? What type of content are they posting? Um, you know, you, you can already see what is working within your space. So, you know, start from there. Jump, jump, use them as a jumping off point. You don't need to do all the work yourself. And then the other thing that clients always ask me is how much time is this going to take? Um, and so, as I said at the beginning, I understand it's, it, this is, a you know, a, it's like one more thing to add to the endless list, um, the, the, you know, endless to-do list that we have. Um, so the short answer is as much time as you want it to take. There is, however, a direct correlation between the amount of time you dedicate to building your personal brand and how quickly you'll see results. And I think, you know, you can see this best with all of the, um, the influencers that have appeared over the last few years, whose whole career is their personal brand. That is how they make their money. And they can rise to prominence very, very quickly because they dedicate, you know, countless hours to, to, to building and developing their brands. That is just unrealistic for most of us. Um, I'm certainly not going to be posting on social media multiple times a day. So my advice to anyone who's not already doing this is to pick one social media platform and post weekly, at, at least weekly. Um, if you do that, you will start to see some benefits um, because you'll be maintaining this consistency with putting your name out there. People will be seeing you crop up in their feeds on a regular basis They'll know who you are and the more that you build on that um you know, the more well known you'll be you'll become for your particular areas of, of expertise um there will always be times in your career where you will be wanting to push your personal brand more than others so if you're looking for a new job or you are looking for investment or you're looking to take on new clients those are the times when you can invest a little bit more time um, in your personal brand 
and you know just just push that self-promotion a little bit more but if you've got that consistent base to work from it just makes life so much easier and then go back to where I started this is an ongoing process so there will there will be times in your life where personal branding is not going to be top of your list of priorities and that's absolutely fine um but the more time you can dedicate it to it uh, the greater the rewards so all I can say now is good luck the best time to start is now so if you are not already actively thinking about your personal brand think about where you want to take it what you want to become known for what your career ambitions are how personal branding might achieve it where you might want to be focusing your attentions do that now um and yeah i'm sticking around so any questions you have after the breakout groups do feel free um to share those with me um if after this session something springs to mind my email address is jenny at brightsprout.co.uk so do feel free to get in touch with me but yeah over to you laura i think for breakout sessions um thank you for that it's got me thinking about um my linkedin in particular my professional uh, sort of uh, brand compared to my instagram which is very much my personal sort of side of things and how you can kind of be i don't know that might be one of the questions we come up with about balancing that personal and that more professional sort of uh, online brand okay so I think uh, one of my helpers is going to split us into uh, breakout rooms. So you should have an invite now. We're going to have a quick chat um, and come up with some questions for Jenny. And then we will be coming back to the full group um, in about 10, 15 minutes. OK, so I will see some people in a, in a group now. And yeah, has anybody got a question? Feel free uh, for, for Jenny, obviously, feel free to put it in the chat or um, to and mute yourself or put a thumbs up or put uh and let us know if you've got a question anybody there yeah we have I have good... oh julie yeah so we had some good conversations around um um your personal brand and basically around um how how much how you should put your content up should you put it um your your personal view up or put your personal content up if it's not adding anything um so there was a little bit of conversation about imposter syndrome again um but whether it, it's if it's not adding anything into the mix um or does it have to be um new uh, or does it can it just be creative content so it's that's just getting that balance in that mix was the question that's yeah, a it's it's always absolutely fine to just share content and say what your opinion is um because that is telling people something about you because if you think that there are millions of pieces of content floating around at any given point in time what you choose to select and share creates a narrative so it is always adding to your personal brand um and you know you 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 could if you take it to the extreme it probably makes more sense so if you were always posting uh, if you're always choosing to share something that was quite negative um then people would very quickly go oh you're a negative person so by taking it to the extreme you can see that it is building a narrative so if you bring it back from the extremes and, and bring it back to your field by constantly posting things that you find relevant and interesting in your field you are building a narrative even if you don't feel like you are um, and you don't feel like you're adding anything to the table you you actually are and um, so i think think thinking thinking about things at the extreme level always helps you to clarify whether what you're doing is 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 um valuable does that does that make sense makes sense to me hopefully yeah good yeah that is a good um, example of always being negative yeah you don't want to perpetuate that continually okay we've got a hand up from uh, carolyn so if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, go ahead. Hi, um, I, well, during 2021, I decided that uh, I wanted to raise my profile. And one of the ways I was doing it, because fitness is hugely important and part of the business I'm setting up, um, it involved seven marathon distance events over the course of the year, which there were all sorts of additional curveballs that sort of came into play. 
Um, but despite all and having a broken leg when I did the last one, um, then I did have done them all and I've been trying to fundraise uh, and I've sort of given myself to the end of February to do that. Uh, I have had some local press coverage. I've got a website um, trying to promote things on social media. And it's just really, uh, I've been in contact with Spotlight TV Wise, um, our local BBC station in Radio Devon. And it's trying to find something that will actually get them to engage with me. They sort of show interest, but don't follow it up. And I've sent them stuff on we transfer in terms of how it all works out. And so any suggestions, because I just thought that if I, I mean, I fitness is key to me being able to do things and um, will make me sustainable to do the business I want to do, which is basically helping people with long-term health issues, use exercise, physical activity to get a good quality of life when medicines aren't available to treat. Um, and there's also a writing side I want to develop. Um, but it's just trying to find some way. Uh, I'm obviously not marketing it quite as I should be, because otherwise I think I'd get the pickup. There's a lot of people that are very, very interested, but to get them to engage in the marketing strategy, marketing strategy I was using was, or want to use, is um, low cost, high volume. Because when you've got marathon distances involved, people think they've got to give a lot of money and that's off putting. So there's an opportunity to give a pound, a euro or a dollar. So I thought I'd go global. Um, then uh, it's actually getting people to make that step commitment wise. And if you like, transfer your prospects into customers. So it sounds like you've already got a really great story around what you're doing. And it's, and it's even got the human element in that you had a, you, so you completed a marathon with a broken leg. Yeah, I've got a knee crutch. Um, if anybody breaks their lower leg and can't wait there, um, there's a company in Western Supermare called Peg Legs, and they sell the eye walk, and it's like a knee crutch, and you rest your knee on it, um, and you can sort of basically walk hands free, no crutches. It, it's it's an amazing bit of kit. Oh wow! Um, so yeah, so it's the the key thing to for getting press coverage is to have a, a human element story. So it sounds like you've got that, but I don't know, are you leading with that? Because the other thing is sound bites are really crucial. So if I was if I was promoting everything that you just said, I would mm -hmm. be finding, um, I'd be finding all the um, uh, journalists of local um, and national media outlets on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. rather than looking for their email, because LinkedIn, it's harder for them to ignore if they if they are active on there mm. and that's the brilliant thing about LinkedIn as well is that whereas before you didn't you know people could be these faceless nameless roles in organizations and now they've probably got a LinkedIn profile so I'd be searching them all um searching for them all on there and then I would be leading with um I've just completed x amount of marathons one with a broken leg I'm trying to raise money for you know these charities can you help raise my profile mm and literally that short and get fire that out to as many people as possible. And then remember as well, that with the new cycle, if something else like that they consider like more important comes along, even if they're interested, they will drop you and go with whatever has, mm. has come along. So you chase them up and be persistent. Mm. Um, you know, I've worked with the press for numerous years and we've been we've had instances where the BBC were due to come and film at a location and we had everyone ready and then they'd ring at the 11th hour and go sorry we're not coming yeah. there's been a big incident mm -hmm. somewhere else and we're going there so then it'd be a, a case of chasing them up saying well can you come next week can you come the week after that we, we would still really like to get this out and um, so there, there's a lot to be said for persistency but in terms of getting people's attention short sharp and to the point with a human element so yeah, I mean, I don't know how they can how they can resist that you completed a, completed a marathon with a broken leg like that in itself is, you know, the stuff of films. So I got, um, I got abandoned in the French Alps. Um, oh my goodness! Yeah, see, there's so much. So, but lead with that. Lead with the the human yeah. elements. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was all sorts of things. I mean, it was a um, 
shall we say it wasn't uneventful. I started off unable to walk because I got a knee problem. So I had a knee replacement at the beginning of February. Middle of May, I did my first marathon walk. Um, I was due to do my seventh event um, and that was um, New York Marathon. And although I'd researched about being able to travel safely, legally, et cetera, with the aid of a uh, Florida-based immigration practitioner, uh, there was an, uh, an immigration official at Heathrow that refused to let me travel. Uh, so it was the most expensive trip to Costa Coffee going. Um, <laughs> and so I still had an event to do, but in the meantime, I found out that I got a double stress fracture. And so it was a case of, I've got an event to do and I was literally pacing up and down the lounge, six paces, turn around, come back, which Strava would record. And I did 26.2 miles like that. Wow. Yeah, so you, wow. need, you need to be presenting <laughs> that right there onto a soundbite and then getting that out to as many people as possible. Well, I think the um, big thing is yeah. I'm not using it enough. Mm. Yeah, I found LinkedIn really, really interesting and useful for networking, just for networking for me, for finding women in STEM who were happy to get involved in our project. Um, but yeah, it's surprising what you can do and who you can find on there. Mm. So is that okay, Carolyn? That's brilliant. Thank you, you very much. Ideas. Fantastic. Well, Thanks, Jenny. Um, right, if anyone else has got a question, please uh, raise your hand uh, and let us know. I've got a question from the breakout room that I was in. So I was talking to Jess, hopefully she's still around. If she, yep, she is. Um, and she was talking about um, a, lo a small business that she runs and whether, I know you're a digital marketing sort of person, Jenny, but whether you've got any um, knowledge, we were talking about print media. So advertising in a local directory for local clients who maybe don't access digital marketing, is it worthwhile these days? Um, have you got any insight into that? Yeah, it's, so with when we've got small business, obviously every penny counts. So you've the best thing to do is go and speak to as many different people you can in your local area and ask them where do you find services do you look in directories or are you um mainly googling people or are you and i would i would almost guarantee they're googling first um that's not to say that print media is dead it's really not um and having like an advert for example in a local paper can still work really well and um, depending on what products and services you're offering but yeah if you if 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 money is tight go and speak to people because if you're if you're a local business and your target customers are local people they're right there so go and ask them if it is a google search then you want to be focusing your attention on google my business um also anything like that with small business marketing do feel free to email me because um there's probably loads you can be doing and we can get into more detail but um but yeah google my business is an absolutely fantastic place to start because it will make sure you're coming up at the top of google searches for no money um and it's very easy to update it's kind of like another social media channel um so that's probably where you're going to see the best results from so yeah i'm not saying that a directory is a bad idea but ask people first before you spend any money yeah that's the thing i think we were talking about that because it is because the, the self-promotion you can do online is free you know apart from the time that obviously you have to um commit to it so it is sort of it's one of the avenues of going down that you do have to pay for adverts isn't it so it's sort of you've got to balance the worthwhileness with the cost okay interesting i hope that helps jess i hope um but so google my business is what she needs to look at to make sure yeah. she's she's in those google searches at the top of the page i think it's, that's, it's basically an online business directory it's uh, okay filling that function so yeah start there and then yeah but speak to people speak to your right. target audience. and do a bit of research yeah as to where yeah. people look for information okay fab anyone else with any questions you want to put their hand up or drop into the chat um i can uh, have a kind of a, a question mm -hmm. we were discussing about um a little bit about how how personal can you be and should you consider your uh, employers 
profile and image when you, especially if you are saying on LinkedIn, which is a very professional platform, uh, have you come across discussions, debates about that you should think about your employer as well as your own? Yeah, so um, it's actually a really good question. I should have said something about this in the presentation. Um, so you will probably have signed a contract that includes a line about not bringing your organization into disrepute. So um, it's because that goes into like pretty much every contract these days. So you should be you should always be mindful of your employer. You should never post anything that could bring them into disrepute. The easiest way to do that is to um, state on your profile that all views are your own and not your employers. Um, and then obviously just be mindful that, you know, say, say you work for Google, um, then don't be posting Google our rubbish. You know, like it's, it's, it's as simple as that really. But yeah, the, the, the line, these are my own views, not my employers, is a little bit of a, a get out of jail free card um, if you are ever at all concerned. Um, but really, you know, it's you, you, you probably don't want to be posting something that is going to upset your employer. You know, that if um, that will probably come across as quite negative unless, I, I, you know, I suppose I suppose there could be instances where you your views might be quite strongly opposed to theirs. Um, but hopefully that would be rare. And in which case, yeah, you could manage it in a, in a diplomatic fashion. Um, but by and large, if you keep things positive, you won't be bringing your employer um, into disrepute anyway. Mm, that makes sense. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Maria. Thanks. Um, leading on from that as well as what I mentioned before, having your personal social media, and um, we've got a question in the chat there that I'll bring up in a minute, and then your professional social media so say like a personal Instagram and a professional LinkedIn um is there any advice you would give on people sort of balancing the personal and the professional things is it's probably worthwhile to keep them separate but I don't know if you've got a, a bit it's, of information on that yeah it very much depends on your personal preferences so if you would rather that your personal social media accounts were just for you and your friends and your family just make them private um you know very simply done and then you don't have to worry about it at all however if your personal account enhances your professional um brand in any way say for example say you're really interested in photography and you work at a um a design agency then obviously the two marry up quite nicely and so it wouldn't hurt for people to find your personal account and see all your amazing photography because it supports your professional image um, so it it completely depends on how you want to use the your, your personal versus your professional um, social media accounts and how how holistic you want to be with your online presence. I personally keep all my personal accounts private because I just think that's easier. It means that you know you don't have to think so much about what you're posting, and I can just say things like "Mum," you know what you're doing um you know it can be a lot more can be a lot more casual um, yeah and you can you know maybe um show a slightly different side of yourself however as i as i said in the presentation consistency is key so really your professional social media should reflect you it shouldn't be, so hmm. different should be totally personal. different yeah. yeah um but yeah my personal preference is just to keep my personal ones private i just find it easier yeah, you don't have to, to like second guess what you're going to say all the time. Yeah. And I think the way you said about as before, I often see that on Twitter particularly about um, this. These are my own thoughts, you know, and and opinions, not my employer or you know, not my, the company that I'm linked to, or whatever. So that makes sense. Yeah, as well. Twitter actually is the is the one that is the most crossover for people mm. a lot of the time. So okay, you that caveat used a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, it's a question in the chat. I don't know if you can see it as well. Um, I'm not sure what BTS is. I don't know if that shows how um, uneducated I am. So um, from a new entrepreneur coming from um, BTS to becoming the face of branding and aiming to launch on Instagram um, to get sales, how do you know if the high numbers of followers are converting to real sales? Um, and do you have to have two different accounts, one as a business owner to get clients, um, also dubbing as an influencer, looking for a brand partnership, okay, behind the scenes, yeah. So sort of one as a networking one and one as your 
business one, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I assume you can see that in the chat, Jenny. So yeah, yeah. Pick it up. Thank you. Yeah. So um, knowing if followers are converting into sales is quite difficult to track unless you you can use things like dedicated landing pages. So if you're putting a link um, in the bio of your Instagram profile, you can make sure that's getting sent to a dedicated landing page so that you can track how many people are actually coming through to there and then follow that through um, by whatever analytics package you're using to see if that's converting into sales. So that's one thing you can do. In terms of having different Instagram accounts, lots of people do um, because it means you can really push an angle with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with each account. So it depends how, how different you, you think the aims are um, you know, these two aims are if you think it could be wrapped up in one account saves you time and effort and means that all of the followers that you gain are, are always going to see both sides of things but if you think that actually this is going to get complicated it's going to be easier to separate out the two and um, then then that can work really well um you know as well but it might just take you a little bit longer to build up that following um, having said that, I'm going to contradict myself now because the more specific and focused your account is, the quicker you will build a, you will build a following. So, um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, totally up to you, really. That one benefits to you know pros and cons to both approaches. Okay, I hope that helps. AA, we haven't got your name there. Um, so yeah, Roz has just posted in the chat as well our WIST network on LinkedIn. So if you are on LinkedIn for your professional networks, then there is a, um, a WIST one there as well. So thanks, AA, thanks for the rep reply there. Um, so feel free to join us on there. Um, oh, we've got, is this a, is this a tip, Alex? Alexander's just popped it in. There you go. Yeah. So it's sort of looking yeah, at analytics. On the effectiveness it? of um, it's it, it's a it's another level of work for those that really want to work out where people are getting interest from with regards to platforms. It's another tip. You have to. It's just more work to do, but you can work out that you're getting lots of hits from LinkedIn rather than Twitter for certain yeah. things. Yeah, you can just see where idea. your your traffic's coming from. Yeah. I'm sure we do that with the Technicamps website and things and, and sort of see where we're getting information from, um, which Megan and Raza are experts at, I'm sure. <laughs> so they know what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, the old dedicated landing pages. So uh, yeah. I definitely recommend that approach. If you like a few numbers and a bit of data crunching, yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> okay, so have we got any more questions? There's a couple of things I want to promote again. So we've got our WIST network, our LinkedIn network there. We've also got our Technicamps newsletter. So if you wanted to find out keep up to date with what's happening with Technicamps we have got a newsletter you can sign up for that on the website as far as I'm aware but I don't know if there'll be a link popped in the chat I'm going to rely on Megan there we go there we go the the mini uh, link for our mailing list um, we're recording this session as as you've been aware as you get notified um, and we will email everyone who signed up for this uh, seminar with the recording and hopefully if Jenny is okay to share the slides with the with her key hints and tips so uh, we'll share those with everyone uh quick question in the chat any tips for building content strategy if you have a limited budget yeah um content strategy doesn't have to cost anything um it's all about um deciding what your key focus is going to be and we talk about content pillars, so it helps if you, you narrow down what you want to, to focus on into maybe um, three content pillars and then make sure that all your content is built around those particular areas so that you're gaining traction as quickly as possible. Um, you know, by, by having those focuses, people immediately know what you're about and what sort of content you're going to be um, pushing so they know whether to follow you or not. Um, and then, um, so I guess in terms of budget, it's how you get that out there. But I would just start with all of the free channels. So, you know, like we said before, determine where your target audience are. Go with the social media channels that is going to, oh, I see, uh, any books or resources. Um, there are countless resources online. If you Google um, content strategy template, you will, you, you, you will get a lot of um, results. If you go for any sort of uh, well-known respected websites, 
you can't go far wrong really but um I would say you could probably Google it on YouTube, or not Google it, YouTube search it, because I always do that. When I'm doing a bit of research, I'll go and I like to watch somebody and listen to someone talk. So I'll Google, you know, how do I do my social media strategy or whatever? And you can probably, you know, it's the same sort of thing, isn't it? Sort of getting an influencer who's happy to, you know, give some information out on that sort of thing. So do a bit of Googling, a bit of uh, online search before you pay for anything. Yeah, I I, I would I would definitely wouldn't pay for it. Just yeah. uh, and also books. Whenever anything to do with digital marketing, um, books become out of date very very quickly. Mm-hmm. So online resources tend to be your best bet. Um, I know quite a few academics who would shout at me for saying that, but <laughs> the 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 online resources will um will you know be the most up to date. Yeah. Unless Alex being in the library there, so I'm assuming he <laughs> likes books. <laughs> <laughs> but he must he must uh, agree with that that digital content can be updated obviously um much quicker than books um okay and any insights on tiktok should we have that as the last discussion oh there we go a loves books um tiktok bit controversial sorry oh. <laughs> if you're right <laughs> carry on jenny um uh, so yeah tiktok um, is pros amazing. and cons maybe yeah tiktok is amazing if that's where your target audience are it's also amazing if you are producing short videos on a regular basis it is a terrible idea if you are not up to date with the latest trends um on the platform it's a terrible idea if no one's ever going to see those videos because they don't go on tiktok um all of my clients at the moment are going should we be on tiktok should we i think we should do some tiktok videos and it's like no you're you, you know you're a conservatories company your clients aren't on there so um yeah it's always always try and be targeted with what you're doing and know that videos are a lot of work so um you know it, it is quite a big time commitment to do anything on video channels if it's your skill if you can do videos already not so much of a challenge if it's new yeah. to you probably not worth the time at the if moment you, maybe if you, do go, if you do go on tiktok do follow the trends anything mm. you post that is one of the tiktok trends will get quite a lot of traction um that that's my main bit of advice on there okay so that's like the songs the dance routines yeah that kind of thing so sort of do yeah. something that's relevant to your work or your your business whatever if yeah. you can shoehorn it in somehow exactly brilliant <laughs> i want to see lots of wist tiktoks now megan okay <laughs> i'm gonna be doing the dances i haven't got a clue i just watch on instagram i'm an instagram person i have to say <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for everyone um oh we've got a question but from mark about hashtags i was thinking about that earlier actually because i used to think hashtags were so important on instagram and then i've just given up on them because i just do it for personal um, enjoyment um do yeah. hashtags uh reach target audience yeah are they worth are, using hashtags are crucial on linkedin and instagram um facebook as an organic platform is is not a thing anymore really so don't worry about it too much there but on okay. um LinkedIn, there, there, there's the the best practice seems to be three hashtags is the okay. um and then on Instagram you can have up to thirty five hashtags um mm. and, and it not really be too many. The advice with Instagram hashtags is to choose some that have um, millions of um, people following them. Choose some that are more specific but still have thousands, and then choose some that are more niche. Um, that you know, niche to what you're offering and have you know maybe hundreds of followers and then okay. also have some branded hashtags as well interesting okay so there is a there is an act to it yeah so do a bit of research on that okay and with the hashtags do you do you sort of search the hashtags first so you can do that on instagram you can you can search a hashtag and see you know how many followers it's got and then you can use that rather than just making up your own but obviously yeah. you can make up your own for your own events if you want people to follow them yeah um, yeah that's what we would determine that's what we call the branded hashtags is when you make up for your particular right okay um and then uh but yeah you can search in advance how many followers each hashtag has and then that's how you determine your strategy then but it's really yeah. important to have you know your 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 mass ones your macro ones your micro ones your your, your individual ones that's that's how you reach the biggest audience it's with with any social media platform it's it's always worth doing a bit of research into their mm. algorithms and how they show how they de- decide to show people content because you can really play to that okay i've always sort of seen people talking about that 
didn't get it so that's quite interesting actually it's a bit of a new info for me on Instagram so thank you so much for that okay so I think we'll we'll wrap it up there if we're happy with that um as I said we're going to record this we're recording it we'll send out the recording later um we do if anyone is in the tech tech industry um we do have a virtual work experience um, event going on in the Easter holidays for school pupils who want to get work experience in the tech industry or digital digital companies, that sort of thing. Um, it's running on the 12th, 13th, 14th of April. So if anyone is interested who is here in providing something for that, whether that's Jenny or somebody else, so it's whether you want to be a member of a panel or do a workshop on how to sell yourself or um, that kind of thing, we're going to, uh, we're always looking for people to take part, so feel free to contact us if you'd be interested in that. Join the, uh, the WIS network, uh, sign up for our newsletter and keep an eye out for our uh, further WIS meetings. I think the next, have we got something planned for for February, Megan, or are we waiting for International Women's Day in March, I think now? Yeah, that's our next event. And then the next virtual webinar will be probably May. May. So we do it bi-monthly, don't we? So every two months, but next one is March, around March the 8th, which is International Women's Day. So we'll be doing lots of events for our Women's Network and Girls Network then. Okay, thank you so much. It's been great to talk to everyone. Lovely to see Jenny. Um, and thank you very much for everyone to take part. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jenny. Bye.